I was the only black kid in my class. And one day the teacher said to me, Julie, tell us about your family backgrounds. I'm part Negro, black, Cherokee. I didn't want to be left out, so I quickly added in French. I lied. I wanted a history like others. Good evening. My name is Angela Davis. We want our collective struggles to be acknowledged in the historical record. Our collective history is central to our identities. I am the child of an activist mother, Sally Bell Davis. She was a national officer and leading organizer of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Like other African-American parents of that day, she was dedicated to creating a better world for her children and their peers. In the 1940s and the 1950s, the U.S. South was a dangerous place, a place where lynchings and other forms of racist violence were used to terrorize black people who simply wanted equality and freedom. The mid 20th century black freedom movement demonstrated that black people were committed to continuing the struggles that had led to the abolition of slavery in the 19th century. Here we are in the 21st century attempting to carry out the legacies of these monumental movements and reflecting on those without whose contributions we would not be at the present historical conjuncture. No one, including those who made this present moment possible, could have predicted that a radical transformation of public consciousness during a dangerous pandemic in the year 2020 would lead to the recognition of the structural and systemic foundations of racism. Yet 2020 has emerged on the historical continuum that connects us with centuries old struggles. The History Makers is an extraordinary project reflecting 20 years of documenting this historical continuum. Under the leadership of its founder, Juliana Richardson, History Makers has encouraged all of us to try to find repositories for our papers. In fact, this is the theme of the 20th convening, preserving 20th century collections with 21st century solutions. As a result of Juliana's urging, I placed my own papers in Harvard Radcliffe's Schlesinger Library, where they are alongside the collections of other activist women. So I would like to publicly thank Juliana for prodding me on. Juliana Richardson's mission is to further stem the loss of our history by finding the resources to digitize the collections of those whose oral histories are in the History Makers archive. We should definitely support her in this undertaking. The thing that always concerned me about the civil rights movement here in Lexington. Audra Grievous was a leader in Lexington civil rights movement, known for organizing downtown lunch counter sit-ins, fighting segregation. Every Sunday morning, my husband and I had to get out there and clean up some of the worst filth that you can imagine that had been thrown in my yard. Her memories are a living history lesson on their way into a national video archive of African American history through the History Makers Project. It's primary source history, which is a really amazing thing. History Makers has done 400 interviews in the last three years, traveling all over the country. We've been to Denver, Wichita, Philadelphia, Detroit, Grand Forks, Aberdeen. Today's stop, Lexington, just one thread in the rich tapestry of African American history. Lexington is just as important as Montgomery or any place else in the United States in terms of civil rights. People we've interviewed here in Lexington have really been, you know, pioneers. We say that this is America's missing stories, um, that uh, American history really won't be complete without this information. 
Our goal is really to create a digital archive that is totally searchable by image and text. And we're actually experimenting with uh, Carnegie Mellon. They've developed some technology working with CNN over the last eight years. So the goal is that, you know, whether you uh, go to the Schomburg Library in New York or DuSable Museum here or the Library of Congress, that people will be able to go and access this collection in its entirety. It's going to take us, you know, five to ten years really to make that collection accessible and, you know, in that manner. Um, the other thing is that we have a very strong educational initiative. Uh, this year is part of our event. Uh, we had a day called Meet the History Makers, a day of education, and we're hoping actually to roll out what we call the History Makers Education Institute using Chicago Public Schools as a pilot program to really bring this history to life. So the program begins and ends on time. I only see that I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Your responsibilities are twofold, just to make sure people get in, make sure that the doors are closed. Oh, I'm getting ready to go for two. Uh, okay. Are you going to? Okay. Hi, are you here for registration? This is the second floor. Five thousand interviews over the next five years. And I want you to tell us how you're going to do that, Juliana. Okay. Just stay right here for one moment. Juliana Richardson, a lawyer who has come up with an idea that is probably more positive than most attorneys come up with. <laughs> and I can say that. What the young lady has done is to is to um, sort of create something that's has been a, a, a need for for so many years, and she's decided to do it on audio visual video as opposed to the written word, which is really unique. This is the first time that History Makers has had a day of education, and I think this is just fantastic. This is an extremely important day from the standpoint of education. We had an interesting group of people. We had a former state senator of Wichita, Kansas, and the mayor of Milledgeville, Georgia. We'll talk about the history of uh, of African Americans coming into uh, the administration of uh, major urban centers uh, in public education and, and the roles they played uh, early on and are playing um, today. I see I'm a professional dancer so I did a few steps for them and I got their attention and then I told them I said I want to take y'all on a little journey with me. I said how many of you want to go? All of them raised up their hands. To be able to uh, have an opportunity to have an audience with these young folks is just a tremendous experience for me and I think it's a great thing that the history makers are doing because it really adds inspiration in the hearts and minds of young people and I like that. To be in the presence of James Montgomery, uh, uh, Mayor Washington's legal counsel, first black mayor of the city of Chicago, I just can't wait to get back to the classroom to share some of the things that, that we've gotten from this uh, conference. It's great. It's really great. And I think the history makers are going to make the young people today really try to go out and make history so they can be a part of the history makers. What we're doing here, we're showing the young people what we have done and showing them how we did it so that they can do likewise and have a successful career. Given up the truth to those I've 
trash, please, right now. What is Africa to me? Copper sun or scarlet sea? Jungle star or jungle track? Strong bronze men or regal black? Woman from whose loins I sprang when the birds of Eden sang. One three centuries removed from the scenes his father's love. Spicy groove, cinnamon tree. What is Africa to me? I sat for my History Maker interview three times, in 2003, 2004, and 2015. I was moved to contribute this oral history after having been invited to interview Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee, who wholeheartedly embrace the vision of the History Makers. So I want to take you back to that moment in 2002 when I shared the stage with these cultural icons and activist legends. The massive Black Lives Matter demonstrations we have witnessed over the last months reflect their shining legacies. Asi and Ruby Presente. <laughs> I have also have not seen one person on your staff. Okay. Okay. But one cannot say that racism has been securely tucked away in the dustbin of history. Okay, one more. Wonderful. Hi, my name is Hannah Richardson Simmons. Welcome to the History Makers. Please, audience, stand and help me in giving this wonderful person a warm welcome, this teacher, author, and political activist, Angela Davis. Thank you. Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee have shaped, literally shaped, the world we inhabit today. They have made it a better place for all of us. Through their art and through their activism, they have never let us forget that we all have a deep moral responsibility to continue to insist on freedom for every person on this earth. Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee. said to the master. 
of having to deal with this reality was a very remote, very remote possibility. It was in no one's mind. When I was growing up, I was taught in American history books that Africa had no history, and neither did I. That I was a savage, about whom the less said the better, who had been saved by Europe and brought to America. And of course, I believed it. I didn't have much choice. Those were the only books there were. Everyone else seemed to agree. If you walk out of Harlem, ride out of Harlem, downtown, the world agrees. What you see is much bigger, cleaner, whiter, richer, safer. Where you are, they collect the garbage. People obviously pay their life in jail. The children are happy. Say, you're not. And you go back home. What is unspoken is a terrible thing. What is unspoken is a terrible thing. What is unspoken is a terrible thing. Oh my. 
to accept the fact that I have to accept, for example, that my ancestors are both white and black, that on that continent we are trying to forge a new identity for which we need each other, and that I am not a ward of America. I am not an object of missionary charity. I am one of the people who built the country. I am one of the people who built this country. I am not a ward or an object of missionary charity. I am one of the people who built this country. Thank you, James Baldwin. These words ring loud and clear in the History Makers archives. And now, ladies and gentlemen, an evening with Ossie Davis and Ruby D. The following program was funded in part by Toyota, AT&T, Baldwin Richardson Foods, Lincoln Financial Group, American Airlines. A complete list is available at thehistorymakers.org. An enduring couple, both on and off the stage, actors, writers, and above all, activists. They are Ossie Davis and Ruby D. National Treasures, their lives committed to the struggle. The History Makers is proud to present an evening with Ossie Davis and Ruby D. And now to our host, teacher, author, and well-known activist, Angela Davis. Ossie Davis and Ruby D have shaped, literally shaped the world we inhabit today. They have made it a better place for all of us. Through their art and through their activism, they have never let us forget that we all have a deep moral responsibility to continue to insist on freedom for every person on this earth. He is an actor, writer, and director. She, an award-winning actress and writer. Both are collaborators, activists, stars of stage and screen, and an inspiration to us all. Please give a warm round of applause for Ossie Davis and Ruby Dean.
our lives have intersected time and time and time again. Yes. And if you'll forgive me, I want to start on a personal note, because I never ask you to tell me the story about how you became involved in the campaign for my freedom. Oh, well, that's right. You know, I really, uh, you, you please start, Ozzy. I don't remember. The campaign started, you know, we had three Davises. What are you going to tell you? <laughs> 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 Who knows? In the course of our involvement, uh, I think Dick Gregory and I had been appointed chairman of a uh, committee to defend the Panthers. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing led to another. Uh, I was involved with people who were friends of mine, who were friends of yours also. Uh, and it was they who suggested that perhaps uh, Ruben and I should be further involved uh, in your affairs as they came along. Uh, Esther Jackson, Jim Jackson, William L. Patterson, yes. Louise Patterson, various other people. Uh, and as part of the continuing struggle, we didn't know you personally at the time, but you were a part of what was happening. But I knew you. Yeah. <laughs> you were a part of what was happening. You were a part of those young people who were on the front lines and really being exterminated by the FBI, a campaign to destroy. A real campaign to destroy the young people who had assumed some leadership role in our society was underway. And this was uh, our way uh, of, of participating and being of help. Uh, so I was asked uh, to do what I do rather well. I was made the head of the committee and then told to sit down and uh, <laughs> so, so somebody else would do all the work. And, uh, it turned out that that was the case. And one of the most ardent workers in your behalf was your own mother. She was so wonderful. <laughs> I, so I knew your mother much better than I ever knew you. But uh, you were, uh, to us, one of the causes that we held dear. Uh, Ruby and I have children. Uh, and we consider, particularly the young people involved in the struggle, uh, that we have an obligation to them. And when you came along, it was a natural step for us to take to say, well, if you're going to come and get that Davis, you might as well line up the rest of us. Because we're, <laughs> and, and honestly, do you remember we had a fundraiser at our house? Yes. And as luck would have it, we got a job and we couldn't be there. You couldn't be there. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no, I couldn't be there, yes. Angela couldn't be there either for reasons which, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a ball, we raised funds, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, contributed to the cause. But one of the most important things we've ever done was to be involved in that particular oh, yes. phase of the struggle with you. We're very, we're very proud yes. of that. Well, I thank you. I thank, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And Ozzy, was that the time, uh, one of the night, nights at Carnegie Hall, when you, they had the bulletproof, uh, <laughs> you were surrounded by uh, uh, bullet Ruby, uh, proof protection? You, you, or am I mixing things up? No, you're not make, mixing things up. <laughs> when, when, a, when the struggle had reached a certain phase, and Angela, you know, had been set free, and was free to go, there was a big rally in Madison Square Garden, mm -hmm. you know, for her, and it, the place was packed. And I was the master of ceremonies. But I had to do my mastering inside a glass bulletproof cage, <laughs> you know. I but uh, you remember that? I but it was part of the madness of the times, yeah. you know. We, we went well, and uh, I thought I looked pretty good in that glass cage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get back to your story. <laughs> let's get back to the reason here. We want to we want to talk about your lives. Um, and we're asking you to tell the story of your lives together. For most of us, where there's Asi, there's Ruby. Mm -hmm. Where there's Ruby, there's Asi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of it. 
But I know there was a time when you were not a couple, when you mm -hmm. were not together. And as a matter of fact, you came from rather different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so let's um, you know, talk about... Uh, Ruby, you're an expert well, on that. Well, um, well to, an, to an extent, uh, the assault on black people was pronounced. And uh, so our, our values um, were similar, although we came from different parts of the c country. We both came from the struggle. You know, I, I don't know any other way. How, how do people be if they don't be from the struggle, you know? Mm -hmm. Because that's how, how much you come from it. I, I remember we wrote it, I wrote, wrote it in my book, thank God. I think everybody needs to write a book so you can really try to remember what happened. And I remember my, my, my first thoughts, I was slow thinking, as getting around to the thinking part of it, but was, uh, had to do with uh, struggles and pickets and police and people getting beat in the street and furniture on the sidewalk uh, getting rained on and somebody going up the, up the street on 7th Avenue where I lived and shooting themselves and the rumors and uh, you know, having rumors in your house borders so that you could pay the rent. And uh, don't buy when you can't work. Don't buy where you can't work. And so, and, um, so I mean, I th these are my first thoughts. Like, imagine happy babies. Remember, the f you know, if they could think back, you know, the joy and tickling and all that, and, and being children. But this is what I remember, and and pictures that um, uh, that shocked my my sensibilities when I was like four and five years old. I don't think I deserve any credit for anything, you understand, because I didn't know any other way to be. I, I remember street corners and pickets and parades, you know, understand? So that's what, that's what I got teethed on. <laughs> well, when, when, I, when on. I came into the struggle, and uh, you want to applaud Ruby? I, I, oh. So. oh yeah. <laughs> Consider my situation. Fresh out of the army, got my first acting job, and then I know that was a part of the struggle because uh, black folks had not at that time been fully accepted downtown. So I jump into the struggle, and guess who's one of the first people I meet struggling alongside of me? Ruby D. That made the, <laughs> that made the struggle all the more exciting. <laughs> And as Ruby said, we, we were on the same wavelength. But that, that is not surprising. Because when we came into the theater, uh, there were luminaries out there who helped define who we were, what our objective should be, mm -hmm. Paul Robeson. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, I think there's a clip coming up. A clip uh, coming up. Yes. Probably do it better than we. Clip on. Let's look at it. <laughs> For Ossie Davis, introduction to the theater occurred in the 1930s at Howard University, where he was introduced to the singing of Marian Anderson and the works of Langston Hughes, County Cullen, and Sterling Brown, who was his teacher. But it was Alan Locke, the nation's first black road scholar, who introduced Ossie to the richness and culture of the theater, steering him from black vaudeville to New York's Rose McClendon Players. After graduating from Hunter High School, Ruby attended Hunter College. Her interest in theater was strong and she showed promise early on. Performances in the American Negro Theater followed. Ossie would be drafted into the Army and stationed in Liberia, West Africa. After three years, Davis would return and coincidentally was asked to play a part about a black veteran returning from the war. It was here in a play called Jeb that Ruby and Ossie would meet. Can you talk for a moment about Jeb? About Jeb? Mm. Well, the, we, it, that was a strange uh, time because when I met Ossie and Jeb, I, I mean, I really didn't like him. I thought he was a very peculiar <laughs> looking person. <laughs> You know, he was about as big as a string bean, and you know, and he had this Adam's apple that sort of stuck out. You know, he was strictly from the country. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I never. I, this is the first time I'd seen, you know, a picture of things that you you'd read about. You know, this tall guy. <laughs> 
you know, with sleeves that, well, that, that on his shirts that came in the middle of his arm, and, and, the, <laughs> and, and the pants came nowhere near his ankles, you know. <laughs> and he was this tall, skinny man dressed, you know, in the well-worn apparel of a short, fat man. You know? <laughs> And his understudy and I used to sit in the theater and we would talk about him. <laughs> and we would say, well, where did he get his clothes? <laughs> and a Bill, Bill, um, Bill Marshall was Ossie's understudy. Yeah. And he would, and I remember Bill said, well, he probably uh, uh, got him, you know, from the, it, it was the goodwill. The, the good from the good from goodwill. And he said, <laughs> and things like that, remarks we would uh, m make about him. And, um, and I, but I do remember one day, and I, I'll just, you can stop me. Mm. I, um, <laughs> that I, he, he was on stage, um, and we, I write about this in the book too, and um, he, he, he played the part of a, re, of a returning soldier and in, in, in the play Jeb by Robert Audrey. And he, at one point, he stood on the tie, slowly, you know, deliberately tying his tie in his uh, soldier's uniform. And I remember sitting with Bill in the audience and looking up at him, and, and um, I, I, something very peculiar happened, you know, because I hadn't been thinking about him in any particular way, and I had no romantic notions about him. But you know, as I watched him, I felt something like a, like a, a bolt of lightning. <laughs> and, you know, an electrical charge, you know, flashed between us. And I was so shocked. I never felt anything like that before. And it, if, I, I thought that was such a corny thing for me to be feeling. It was, a, it was so strange because I, I really didn't even like him. <laughs> and you were from New York, right? Yeah, I, mean, I don't know what, what that had to do with it or, or what. I don't know. We agreed he was a good actor, you know. And then, but I do remember that uh, sometime later, I told him about this strange sensation, sensation I had uh, as uh, he was working, and uh, because I was curious to know if he felt anything. I mean, it was such a <laughs> such a powerful thing, you know. And he says, and he says, um, and he says, uh, no, Ruby, I didn't feel a thing. <laughs> I was shocked, <laughs> but but we married anyway, you know. <laughs> so, Austin, yeah. perhaps you can tell your well, side of the story. Well, uh, everybody oh my referred goodness. to me as country because of my peculiar clothes. <laughs> I was aware of that, and look, which one of, out of them all that Ruby married? I knew what I was doing when I put on them bad looking clothes. Yeah. <laughs> you got to make the woman feel sorry for you. you know? <laughs> so I looked so bad that Ruby took me as a life's occupation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so you were married in 1948. Uh, yes, 1948. in 1948. We were, we were both working in a play, and we had one uh, Thursday off, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we hopped on a bus and a subway and went to New Jersey. And we uh, found a minister, and we got married. And he, uh, Ruby's sister was her best uh, lady, and I had my brother with me. Uh, I had borrowed the train fare from my brother, so he was coming along. <laughs> That's his investment. But there we stood, you know, in, in, in the, uh, in in the, the preacher's, yeah. what is the rectory? Where was the preacher? Mm -hmm. And the preacher was a sort of a round man. He was extended this way and that way. And he had two eyes, and they were sort of fickle one to the other. One eye went that way, one eye went that way. So, I, I was standing before him, and he looked at me very seriously, and he looked on the things, I said, Davis, uh, do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? And I looked, 
one of the eyes was on Ruby. The other eye was on Ruby's sister, and she was a good-looking child. <laughs> so, I said, so I said, yeah, quick, you know, two for the price of one. <laughs> but but we, we, no, we did marry, and uh, we came home, and when we got around to it, we started a family and a life, and it's sort of been going on ever since. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you agree? Yes, and so I want to... Mm, talk about some of the people uh, who were around during that period in your lives. Uh, I know you were very close to Harry Belafonte. Uh, Harry was a member of the, also of the American Negro Theater. He and Sidney came along a little uh, after I, I joined, and... Um, and that, that was a time for all of us, you know. I don't think, at least the people in, in the theater, uh, you, it, it wasn't an indifferent time. I, I do remember, I don't have one of those memories that soaks everything up, like Ossie, you know, he remembers things that happened in 1901. <laughs> no, not really. But you know, he remembers these, you know, uh, long times past, or he just knows about them. But, and he reads a lot too, so he, he really educated both of us. And, uh, but we came from a time when, before unions were, the, 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 the unions were solid. Uh, and I, and I, I, I remember Harry and, and oh, so many, name some of the people, uh, like, uh, and Marlon Brando, and, and um, was, was, uh, was, uh, um, uh, so many people that you don't know now, uh, Avon Long. And mm -hmm. I remember all those kinds of people, mostly from people's houses where we would be gathered raising funds for one thing or another. And a little earlier than that, where we would be uh, helping, each, helping somebody pay rent because that was before, um, a lot of the things before the union. Funds. Uh, funds, funds, funds were mm -hmm. heavy. And also uh, uh, the, uh, the anti, the, 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 the poll tax was up for there and up at the, around that time. And the anti-lynching laws, I don't know mm -hmm. whether they had been passed or not. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so all of that was uh, part of that, um, uh, part, part of that movement. And you see all kinds of people, actors, mus singers, uh, musicians uh, come to Harlem. There'd be something at somebody's <coughs> house most, most every weekend, and especially, especially if you were in a show. And if you weren't, you just gravitate there anyway. There, there was a coming together around the issues is what I'm trying to say. And that, um, that I found so stimulating. Not at the time, because at the time it seemed just like what you're supposed to do, you know? I, I, um, uh, it, only as I looked back on it did I realize how remarkable and how wonderful a time it, that was. It, it was a special moment for the theater uh, on Broadway. Uh, Paul Robeson was there, as, as we yes. said, Lena mm -hmm. Horne, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, Canada Lee, mm -hmm. and they took a leadership position. But consider for a moment what the times were like. We who had fought in World War II fought with the expectation that the country was going to change its policy toward black folks. But when we got back home, we found that the country had no intention of changing its policy and went out of its way to let us know in many ways that that was not going to happen. Uh, there were certain cases where veterans uh, were in serious trouble. Young man, Isaac Wooder, down in Carolina, you know, had his eyes gouged out while he was still in uniform on a bus. You know, uh, 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 two uh, veterans in uh, uh, Monroe, Georgia, walking with their wives along a road in uniform, shot down by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, a young man, Mapes, trying to vote in Georgia, you know, killed. And uh, so the theater was, always concerned uh, about these, these things. And as Ruby said, uh, every night somebody would suggest a, a party somewhere. Uh, Rosalie Ingram, whose sons had killed a white man because the white man had molested her, you know, and, 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 and various other causes. Somebody being uh, tried, somebody being uh, lynched, or somebody being put on the chain gang. And we would meet to raise funds. Mm -hmm. Paul Robeson would be there, uh, and Austin Wells. And, and, and members of the theater, the theater took itself quite seriously. But many of them felt the awful consequences of 
McCarthyism. Oh, yes. But you see that. That was a little bit later on. I want to listen to uh, your amazing story. Uh, but I'm told there's another clip coming I up. See. Okay. So. The clips have <laughs> clips have it. Let's have the clips. <laughs> It can't eclipse the clips. The McCarthy period devastated many in Hollywood and the rest of the creative community. Paul Robeson, the Rosenbergs, and scores of others were caught up in a dragnet of suspicion, and yet the 50s were the decade of the Montgomery bus boycott, Rosa Parks, and Martin Luther King. The 60s would usher in a time of change, the March on Washington, the rise and fall of Malcolm X, and the assassination of Martin Luther King. Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee's lives as activists were intertwined with their careers as artists. They joined the casts of the Jackie Robinson story, the Broadway production of Green Pastures, the musical Jamaica, and last but not least, Lorraine Hansberry's Raisin in the Sun. This is my time in life. I die. To say goodbye to these old, tired walls. And these marching cockroaches. <laughs> and this grand little closet, which ain't now and never was no kitchen. And I say it loud and good. Hallelujah. Goodbye, misery. I'll never want to see your ugly face. I think about all those people who came out of Hollywood. And that was the first time in my life where it was, it was solidly wedded uh, it was uh, the, the struggle and the art, you know. And um, there were a lot of Jewish people who came from Hollywood. Uh, I, I'm, I'm still trying to put those things in perspective because they, um, they helped, they added pieces to the puzzle. They, um, they, they spoke to uh, artistic responsibility, personal responsibility, the people's uh, part in struggle, and they really g gave us things to think about. Um, I got in involved in a deeper, deeper level because of the um, Rosenbergs, for example. And, um, um, and, and, and also... The defense of Paul Robeson. And the defense of Paul Robeson and all those, those kinds of things. I think, it's, I think the McCarthy period is, is too important to, to gloss over because I'd yes. like to go back a little bit. As I said before, in the theater community, we were very active in trying to secure the rights uh, of African Americans uh, after World War II. Not only were we involved in that, but we took a serious look at all the issues in the world. I remember having a big rally at Medicine Square Garden where the theatrical community took it upon itself to tell the United States government that we had no right to have access to the atom bomb on our own. We should share the knowledge with the rest of the world. And not only that, we took a strong stand on building a United Nations as an instrument against war. And Robeson was particularly eloquent about the denial of uh, uh, freedom for the African continent. You know, uh, it was a, the World War II was for the Africans also a fight against colonialism. So all of these fights were there, and all of us were, we, we were there, and we were on the streets, and we were doing marvelous things, and that is one of the reasons why the committees came to deliberately cut us down. We were the object of their ire, and they determined that those actors, and Paul Robeson, and those people were not going to influence government policy. What the America did uh, to the colonies in Africa was none of the actors' business. What America did about not passing an anti-lynch law was none of the actors' business. We were supposed to be like children, do the plays, go home, and forget about it. And those of us who didn't, they put on a list, 
and they came and they subpoenaed us and they made us stand trial and to defend ourselves as if we were traitors. But there was a pattern to what they did and they succeeded in cutting much of the manhood out of Broadway and Hollywood. And that, that's true to this day. And, and, and so the struggle for Paul's passport uh, was for the, uh, for the actors, uh, also a part of our trying to vindicate ourselves to support him, but also to, to support our own struggle. Now, Paul had to fight about eight years to get his passport, you know, and they succeeded in separating Paul, in a sense, from the mainline struggle. Not because Paul was not involved in the mainline struggle, but he, he also became a cause. Getting him his passport became a movement of its own. Well, that split him and his group off from the middle class black uh, uh, members of the NAACP who were trying, and, and, and the Urban League, and a lot of us who thought we could work with the Congress and with the president to get the anti-lynching law passed, you know. But all of this is, is, is a sign of the kind of, uh, of world that it was out there and a kind of life that we lived, Rube and I, waiting for the phone to ring, waiting for somebody to say there's going to be a meeting, or somebody says we need somebody to raise funds, we need somebody to uh, be the master of ceremonies, we need somebody to do this and to do that. Ruby, you and I say you can do it, so please come and do it. We consider that our serious responsibility, and we always tried whenever the leadership called, or uh, other groups, to do that job. And as the leadership matured and changed, and, and people like uh, Dr. King came on the scene and Malcolm X came on the scene, Ruby and Asi were, were still in the, pretty much in the same position. You know, pass out the leaflets, raise the funds, make the speech, do the MC, all of those various things. And to this, and we still do it. You had a relationship with Dr. King. Yes. But you also had a relationship with Malcolm X. Yes. Oh, yes. And yes. So let's yes. talk about that. Uh, yes, Malcolm. Moment. Well, we were able, uh, part of it through longevity, part of it having <laughs> been because we were in the struggle for such a long time, to see how the various threads of the black experience you know, knit themselves together. And uh, we could understand historically where uh, Dr. King might be coming from as he preached integration. Yes. Uh, and his middle class background, his southern background. Uh, we could also understand Malcolm from the black nationalist perspective, uh, where he came from, speaking eloquently to the streets of the North. But we understood that those that they both were part of the same struggle. And Ruby and Juanita Poitier arranged a get-together meeting one Saturday at which Malcolm was invited, Martin was invited, and the black leadership were invited. And they came to that meeting for the purpose of discussing ways by which to get together. That was in February of 1965. And two weeks, Malcolm was dead. So none of that ever happened. Yes. But it was a part of what we were trying to do to pull them together because it was the struggle that was important. Yes. It was the fact that they related to our needs that was important, not about the uh, surface differences that they might have had. Yes. We felt that way about it. I remember when we first had a party for Malcolm and we invited all oh, so many people, you know, in the arts, everybody we knew to meet Malcolm. He was, my brother had introduced it to, us to him. Uh, um, he, one day, I, I'd love to t tell you about that sometime because he changed my brother's life. He, uh, at, at any rate, we weren't taking pictures. M M M M M Malcolm came to the house with his gun and his, uh, with that, uh, shotguns, and road, road, road shotgun, you know, in, in, the, in the Jeeps, in the back windows and stuff like that. And but when he came, I told him he could have to please, I had to have the cameras and stuff. So I put those in the bedroom because I didn't want anybody to get nervous. You know, oh God, I think about it now. And, and I missed all those pictures. As, and because, because I was intimidated too. This 
is what I'm saying. I, I um, and now that I'm older, uh, I, I feel that oh, I'm no longer intimidated. I feel now I'm old enough to do anything I damn well please. <laughs> And, and, and this is why I feel that there's hope for, for, this, for this country, you know. We have much to protect. We have greatness in this country. And we, 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 we can't throw it away like toilet paper. We can't ignore these things. And so I'm thinking now, mm-hmm, the, 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 we have to get back. We have to get back. We have to get the thieves out of the saddle. And for so, our young people. So, so, but with the, so those 65 and older, I don't know where that army's coming from, but, but for, for 65 and older, we have a few brain cells left, a few dollars in the bank. You know, it's time to make a time again. We can't go down the sinkhole behind, a, you know, behind those people who are not worthy of the virtues that this country still represents. We've got to save them. I would like to say a word or two about the children. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they may be watching. And they, they're, they're good. Now, what we did, and I don't know whether it was because we were wise or because we were broke and couldn't afford babysitters, but we would take the children everywhere we went so they were part of the struggle too. They walked picket lines, you know, and handed out leaflets. They were always involved. They never had to ask, where is daddy and mommy? And when they were growing up, we got all the kids together and said, you know, this is the first time we've been parents. We don't know how it works, but this is the way it's going to work from here on in. Now, we're not going to allow you to do anything out in the world that you cannot do in this house. We may hate it, we may, but you're going to do it here or you won't do it out there. The one thing that we're going to abide by, one law, Nobody can fall out. Nobody can leave. Nobody can quit. You know, you are still a part of the family. We belong together. We belong to each other. And that's the way it's going to be. And somehow that resolved whatever differences they might have had. And they have been ardent members of the struggle. We've had no trouble with them as children ever since that time, you know. And uh, we walked the big picket lines with us. Yes. In my own. Our, our, our oldest, uh, no, no, our youngest daughter, who is now a print, the principal of a, of, a, of a high school in Rockland County, New York. And um, we were so proud when she, uh, I have to just uh, say this, uh, joined the teachers in, um, uh, in a picket line protesting uh, the, 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 because they didn't have a contract. Uh, and so that she was active in the movement, you know, and they, and they all are. They have a political awareness. My son, he went with his, the, the, um, the, 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 our grandchildren walked with us when, in one of the, uh, for Emma Judiala, was it? And, uh, and so there's that kind of thing that I greatly appreciate in them, that they have a nice sense of value, <laughs> you know. They, you know <clears throat> and we recommend that to all families, you know, and, you know, <laughs> deal with the children. Take them into the struggle with you. You know, and as far as cotton comes to Harlem, you know, I, I was happy that I directed that. It came along at a time when Hollywood was in serious trouble. They had made a big film called Cleopatra. It cost $30 million. And met everybody in Hollywood was crying poor. And uh, United Artists gave Sam Goldwyn the money yes. uh, to uh, make a, a, a film called Cotton Comes to Harlem. Uh, Sam asked me to direct it. I didn't want to, but he insisted. I did direct it, and uh, uh, it came out. And it so happens that it was a film which we made inexpensively enough so that if only African Americans came to see it, the film would still make a big profit. You know, Raisin in the Sun had not made money as a film. Uh, Gordon Parks, The Linear Tree had not made money. But Cotton made money with only the African-American community giving it their support. Hollywood, being broke, looked and they saw and said, hey, come in. And they, <laughs> and they made it for 10 years. You know, uh, we were allowed to make film, uh, which they call exploitation film. And then when black folks got tired of that and refused to come, 
they showed us the back door. Said, well, it was nice of you to come, and maybe some other day we'll get you back again. <laughs> And that's the black exploitation, and they brought in a new kind of what I call a stereotype. Uh, like as, as Spike said, he could get money to do a hood film, but he couldn't get money to do a family relationship film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was the, the the story from a number of the young Hollywood uh, producers and directors. You were doing a great deal during that period. Um, mm -hmm. um, there was. Zora is my name. Yes. Countdown at Cassini. Um, Roots. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not Rappaport. Mm -hmm. And then you wrote my one good nerve, yes, and you yes, did the yes. court martial of Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. How many years after you had done the Jackie Robinson story, story yes, did I, you do? I played his mother. <laughs> and you <laughs> in those years, like much. Originally, later. you had played. Rachel. Wife. And then I, I played his wife. I started having exactly. his wife. And then it is as his mother. And, um, uh, well. We're I, waiting for Ruby to get a chance to play his grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but I also want to mention um, Eyes on the Prize. Ah, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> But in the late 1980s, you met a young film director who had taken the industry by storm when he did a film called She's Gotta Have It. Mm -hmm. Both of you appeared in several of his films, which meant that a new generation came to know you and, and love you and respect you. So let's... Look at another clip. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. In 1989, Ossie Davis and Ruby D appeared in the controversial Spike Lee film, Do the Right Thing. Hey, you old drunk. What did I tell you about drinking in front of my stoop? Move on, you're blocking my view. You are ugly enough. Don't stare at me. The evil eye doesn't work on me. Mother, sister. You've been talking about me for 18 years. What have I ever done to you? You a drunk fool. Besides that, the mayor don't bother nobody. And nobody don't bother the mayor. But you, the mayor just tend to his own business. I love everybody. I even love you. Hold your tongue. You don't have that much love. One day, you're going to be nice to me. We may both be dead and buried, but you're going to be nice, at least civil. Two years later, in Jungle Fever, Ossie and Ruby give riveting performances as parents of two sons, one with a drug problem and the other with a marriage in trouble. Ruby expressed the despair of a mother over her wayward son. Don't tell your father. Lucinda. What is he doing in our home? The he is your son, our son, our first child, Gator, and I'm fixing him something neat. He is not allowed in our home. But this is his home, too. How much money did he ask you for? No. Gator did no such thing. Now, why don't you go in there and listen to my while I get him something to eat? Now, go on back inside. Go on. In 1996, Spike Lee dramatized the spirit of the Million Man March in the film Get on the Bus. Ossie Davis played Jeremiah. No. No, no young blood, your hands are too flat like a pancake, and you have to loosen up your wrist. Don't beat the drum. Make love to it. You know what I mean? Make love to the drum. Make love to like the drum. Like <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and okay. easy does it. Okay. Slow, Slow and easy. easy, steady. Yes, sir. There you go. There you go. Like this? Yeah. Oh, that would last you all night long. Yeah. Tell us about your collaboration with Spike Lee. Um, Spike was uh, a young man that came to our attention 
through our son Guy, who said to us, I, there's a guy that I invested $500 in his film, and guess what? He's paying me back. <laughs> we were thoroughly shocked by this unorthodox behavior. <laughs> but upon investigation, it turned out to be true. Spike paid off his investors. And then uh, we got to know him, and he said that there were parts that he wanted Ruby and me to play uh, in his film, and he was true to that too. And he became our role model. No other director has given us so many roles to play. <laughs> Yes, and it's very, and that directors that you get paid back, uh, you know, when you work for a percentage. I had not known this to happen but once before <laughs> in my life. And, uh, and he, because our son would say, hey, Ma, I got another check from Spike, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he, and he was, he's a man of integrity, and he did so much to open up the, the unions. Everybody worked for Spike, you know, women, men, white, black, the, the, the physically handicapped, the challenge, uh, the, um, uh, um, everybody worked for Spike. And what about that connection between art and politics? Did you yes. find that in your work with Spike? Uh, yes, we do. By and what he did. That, and that there's an interesting thing, and it constitutes a challenge for us. Uh, there are areas where Spike, for all of his brilliance, uh, doesn't have any connection with the culture that came before. When we did Jungle Fever, for example, uh, I did the writing of the part because Spike was not familiar with what went on in the church and how it would work out and various things like that. And even when he came to do the film Malcolm X, I had uh, some reservations even after I saw the film. And I said to myself, and I hope Ruby was listening, I said, I like what Spike has done with the film Malcolm X, but I'd like to come back in 10 years and see what he would do with it then. Because it, the, the, Spike, in a sense, represents that area in our experience where we have to make absolutely sure that the materials of our lives are available to them this material that we're doing now, the history makers, we do this in part to make available to Spike the material he needs to complete his education. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, also, and also I say uh, uh, to complete our education because I learned a lot from Spike. I learned, a so lot. I. I learned a lot because he, he fought the big boys. He got those unions open because he, was, he made them open the unions, you know. So I learned something from Spike. And, and, you know, so that, that's what made me, and, and I'm, I'm philosophically in all those other ways, um, we're, we're, we're working together with each other. I, I thought because he was so young, I just, just said you this, and he, oh, he looked like a baby, you know. So the part I was doing as Lucinda, you know, and his, the, the boys were named Gator and Flipper, Flipper and Gator. I said, was, so I wrote him a letter because I knew he'd appreciate this if I told him in, in this serious paper, in this serious film, he should name those boys Gator and Flipper. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and of course, I wrote my ideas of how how he, this boy could be saved. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he was very nice, but he never answered me back. <laughs> and I learned that we have to cross fertilize each other in terms of thinking, and that the generations coming in do have something to offer, and the frustrations uh, that they experience are not to be taken lightly, and that we can help, we can change, we can exchange ideas, and we can. Help, help save them, you know. I well, think was, they're waiting for us You think Get On to... the Bus was, um, yes. in a sense, an attempt to represent that cross-fertilization, yes. that conversation across generations? Oh, I, I think so. Uh, it was Spike's courage to take a current event, you know, and uh, translate it 
into a, a, a film event and present it because he felt that the film would help explain the real events and complete the picture in the public's mind. Now, to use Hollywood in a serious fashion is, is, is unheard of almost, but Spike dares to do that. And also, one of the things I'm waiting on Spike for now is Ruben and I have a grandson, and his name is Muta Ali uh, Muhammad, and he too is a filmmaker. So we want him to get in touch with Uncle Spike as soon as he can. <laughs> have this one more thing to say about Spike mm -hmm. and how what we, and what he what he what he does. He, despite all the odds, Hollywood turned him down, but he made that picture. And he made it getting a dollar here and 25 cents here and from credit cards and from his mama and from the, the Delta Sigma Theta sorority and other sororities and fraternities. And he did it anyhow. He did it. He, he did it. What's it that the Malcolm always said? And, you know, the best, not the best way you can. Anyway, by any means, by any means necessary. necessary. Yeah. 40 he acres and a mule, yeah. yes, yes. And then, when he had, had his offering, the, the, the establishment, Hollywood, turned around and looked at him and opened the doors to him and, and a number of other young filmmakers, too. The two of you have continually reinvented yourselves for <laughs> generation after generation. And I know that now um, many people are aware of your involvement in the campaign against the death penalty yes. and the yes. struggle to free uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And it seems as if you're always busy. Mm -hmm. You're working harder and harder. Mm -hmm. Ruby and I are doing what we love to do in the way that we love to do it. We have been tremendously blessed in all areas, not only by God, but by the love of our own people. Oftentimes, um, young people and not so young people <coughs> ask um, how one becomes an activist. What causes one yes. to develop this commitment to yes justice and yes. equality and, and freedom. And I think your lives indicate that it's not about a particular moment. That's right. It's about learning to live one's life in a particular way. Here, here. Yes, learning yes. Learning to live yes. one's life in the struggle. Yes. yes. And, and, and it's the struggle in a sense because that, 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 that teaches you what love is. You know, and, so um, what are some of the, the contemporary struggles you're interested in? I read an interview uh, with both of you, and I think you were talking about the campaign against globalization. Oh, yeah. Yes. And the campaign uh, against the prison industrial complex. Oh, yes. Well, the, the, in, in the 60s, um, the, the, the countries in the third world and in Africa uh, shared colonialism and stood free and clear and raised their flags uh, at the United Nations, uh, equal, uh, presumably, to the rest of humankind. And we all were inspired. We all cried as the old uh, f colonial flag came down and the new flags went up. We had such high hopes and expectations that that would be a turning point for the good of man and, and womankind in the world. Now, it, particularly in Africa, because in Africa at that time, of all the countries there, only two were free. Every country in Africa except two were colonial uh, colonies. And all of that was over, and Africa was free. What wonderful things were going to happen. And we look today, and we see Africa in, in despair, and the load on her back now, and not the chains of colonialism, but debt which he cannot pay. How did that happen? You know, what, what went wrong? What did they try to do? And why did what they tried to do not work? What part did we play in what has happened on the African continent now that 
in the southern part of Af Africa as we speak, you know, people are dying of hunger every day. Now, what part do we play in that? Africa has two commodities that she can offer the world, agricultural products and textiles. But Africa cannot sell her agricultural products and textiles on the markets that make the difference. Why? She cannot sell them in Europe. She cannot sell them in America. And as long as the powers that be, the global market, keeps Africa at that disadvantage, she will always be in a position to be beggars. And we cannot afford that the mother continent should be beggars anymore. We must, we must, we must first understand history. We must first understand how it came to pass. We must first understand the instrumentalities by which it came to pass. Then we can fashion a strategy based upon our collective efforts here and with other people all over the world who are looking at the International Monetary Fund, who are looking at the World Bank, who are looking at the World Trade Organization and beginning to ask questions. We need to look to and to learn and to be able to go back into the streets one more time and raise again the flag of struggle. And this time, we're going to change it so that Africa will not ever again have to come before the world as a beggar. She is proud, she has produced kings, she's produced queens at one time. She can do it again, but only with our help, and we can only do it if we know, if we study, if we take advantage of the information is there. And there is knowledge to be had. Even our own experiences are eloquent to that point. So let's all study to make ourselves better fighters in the cause of freedom and equality. So now we really are winding down. I really wish we could continue this fascinating so do I conversation. Oh my God, uh, yes. could go on for hours and yeah. days. Uh, yeah. But this has been such a wonderful evening. And I'd like to thank you, Asi and Ruju, for your infinite generosity, for your generosity this evening in sharing your lives with us, for your generosity over the years. This will always be a moment that uh, I will treasure, and I'm sure that uh, for all of us, this is an unforgettable evening. So thank you, Asi and Ruby. Thank you. program was produced by the History Makers, which is solely responsible for its content. For more information, or to order your own copy of An Evening with Ozzie Davis and Ruby D, please visit thehistorymakers.org or call 866-914-1900. That's 866-914-1900. The preceding program was funded in part by Toyota, AT&T, Baldwin Richardson Foods, Lincoln Financial Group, American Airlines. A complete list is available 